Romans 3, getting at verse 21. But now, a righteousness from God apart from law has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. On what principle? On that of observing the law? No, but on that of faith. For we maintain that one is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Pray with me, please. Lord, we thank you for your holy word. We pray now that you would empower your servant to declare it clearly and faithfully. We pray that we, your people, would continue to remember that now we are in worship. And so you would attune our hearts and minds so that we might be focused on you and what you've done for us through Jesus Christ, that we may continue to speak well of you to ourselves, to those close to us, to those around us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said, we're continuing in our series, Foundations of Our Faith, the Fundamentals of Our Faith, so that we could have a clear, sure, and solid grounding as to what God has done, what it means in our lives, and how it propels us to go further in our walk with him. As we arrive at the latter part of Romans 3, Paul has already made the case in the first part that all are, are what he calls under sin. That is, we are responsible for breaking God's law and apart from God's intervening grace, we would surely face his fierce anger because of our own rebellion. But it's interesting, the way Paul seems to lay it out is almost like he is in a courtroom laying out a court case against us. And if you're like me, you love a good courtroom drama. Anybody got a good courtroom drama that they like? Judge Judy. Ain't nothing wrong with Judge Judy. One of my favorites is the movie Nuts with Richard Dreyfuss and Barbara Streisand. And, 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 and I just love how the, the movies and the depictions, I love Just Mercy and, and, and movies like that, where there is this courtroom scene, there's this courtroom drama, and, and you don't know which way it's going to turn. You're waiting with bated breath, and then a verdict is handed down. And if the person is declared not guilty, what's so wonderful is that he or she may have been walked in by the authorities with handcuffs on or chains on or something like that. But the moment they're declared to be not guilty, they're a free person. And I believe that one of the things Paul was doing in this latter part of the chapter, even the first part, is really comparing what Christ has done to us and for us to being 
in a court of law, but this time in God's court of law. Again, the first part lays out the case against us in clear, unmistakable terms. Terms that we cannot get around, terms that we cannot rationalize, terms for which we have no excuse. We have broken God's law. However, God has flipped the script. He is in effect made a distinctive change so that even though we have broken his law, we don't have to pay for what we've done because Christ has paid for what we did. And that's possible and true because one of the core issues of this entire series, in fact, even diving back into God being a mission-focused God, is that the living God wants to have a connection with us. God wants to have a connection with us. And he has sent his son to cement and to solidify that connection. So what we're gonna do in this particular passage, Romans 3, mainly 21 through 24, is highlight two points with respect to that connection. You'll follow along with me as I read the scripture again. But one, through Christ, the living God has provided a perfect, permanent right standing before him. Through Christ, the living God has provided for us a perfect, permanent right standing before him. And through Christ, the living God has promised to give that perfect righteousness to anyone who believes in the finished work of Christ. So let's get to the first point. Through Christ, the living God has provided a perfect, permanent right standing. Listen again to verse 21. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and prophets testify. God's law revealed his perfect standard of what is right and what is wrong. God's law reveals what it means to be a perfectly moral being in the universe that he's created. And guess what? Because God created the universe, because he created the world, because he sustains the world, it literally is his world. We just live in it. And therefore, we have to live in it according to his rules. It reminds me of that old Bernie Mac um, line on his TV show when he's introducing his nieces, his, his nieces and nephews to his house and he's walking them around. He says, now look, let me make something clear. This is your home. This is all our home. You're living here with me now. This is on his TV show. He says, but this is my house. And because this is my house, everyone in my house must live according to my rules. For well, the earth, if I can say it that way, is the Lord's house. He sets the terms, the parameters, the boundaries, the rules of morality that govern his house. And in his word, we find ample evidence of that morality, of that holiness, of that law. We read it in Psalm 15. Again, a wonderful psalm that asks the question, who is it exactly who can be in God's house? Who can stand in his presence? Who can enjoy his favor? And then the next line who says, says, he whose walk or whose entire life for his or her entire life is blameless. That's all it takes. Imagine if you wanted your child as they grow older to go into a particular college and the college said, oh yes, oh yes. Your child is certainly invited to apply. Please do. We said, yeah, you are. Can, can you go ahead and apply? Bring your brother too. But then they said, we just expect perfection. 
we expect not only perfection in every test they took, but every paper they wrote from grade school to high school. That we expect perfection in every quiz. That we expected perfection, not simply in 94 to get an A, but no, 100%. We expected perfection on every single solitary assignment they ever did without fail. They don't get perfection, they can't get it. It's the same with us before the living God with respect to our morality. He, as he is God, commands and demands perfection. That's the righteousness. And yet we know that we're imperfect, so thank God that the scripture says, but God, we serve a God who says, but God, I'm flipping the script, because the righteousness that he is talking about that's been revealed is the very life of Jesus Christ. He is not only the fulfillment, but he is the complete ultimate epitome of the righteousness of God. He, as a man, Follow God's word perfectly. That's why the answer to that question in Psalm 15 is Jesus Christ. The answer to the question in Psalm 1, the blessed man, is Jesus Christ. He is the one who can stand. He is the one who can go, be, amen, who can go before the great congregation and says, I have kept the law. I am morally spotless and pure. It's just a wonderful thing because we, on our own, could never do it. Even if we could do so with actions, and some of us might, the word of God deals with far more than just our actions. It deals with the way we speak. It deals with how we think, the intentions of our heart. You know, we call that passage, in Matthew 5, where Jesus said, you have heard it said, you shall not murder. But I say to you, if you have anger in your heart such that you would want to harm someone, you have broken that command. Christ is the fulfillment of God's law. He established what I call a perfect, permanent, right standing before the living God as a man. He is the man who lived in this world in such a way that he could have gone straight back to heaven and been fully accepted. But now, a righteousness from God has been revealed, has been made known, has been manifested. It is a righteousness that we read throughout scripture as we read in Psalm 15. And it's a righteousness found in Christ only and Christ alone. And that is such good news. Because as we're gonna find, especially as we get into Romans six and seven, even following our salvation, we still struggle with sin. We still mess up. We still trip up. Sometimes we don't mean it. Sometimes we really do mean it. Sometimes we say, you know, I'm going to cop an attitude. Because I'm, I'm, I'm feeling myself. I'm in my feelings, and I'm just going to cop an attitude. Lord, I know it's not right, but, you know, I'm going to do me. We need a righteousness. That is not our own. We need a foundation of a connection with the living God that has been secured by Jesus Christ so that we know, that we know, dear ones, that we know that when we go to him in worship or prayer or just living our lives, that he is utterly, completely, totally pleased with us. And if you are in Christ, that is true right now. If you are in Christ, that will be true later on when you go home and eat dinner and watching your favorite TV show. If you're in Christ, that's gonna be true tomorrow morning when you get up to go to work. When we're in Christ, we are the delight of the living God. 
But now, a righteousness has been manifested, has been made known, has appeared to which the law and the prophets, that is the entire scripture bear witness. So that's the first part, is that through Christ, the living God has provided a perfect, permanent, right standing before him. Secondly, through Christ or in Christ, God has promised to give this perfect righteousness to anyone who realizes his or her need for it, repents, and then asks for it. Listen to verses 22 through 24. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God gives Christ's perfect, permanent, right standing to anyone who realizes his or her need for it and believes in Jesus Christ. Now, listen carefully. Belief in this context is to count as absolutely true. It is to count as absolutely true. What is absolutely true with respect to Romans 3 and this right standing? Well, first of all, what is absolutely true is that we have deliberately broken God's law. And we are subject to his judgment. Again, if we want to go back to our courtroom narrative, we are brought into the court. The charges against us are laid out. And then the courtroom begins to put together all of the evidence. They have this on video saying we're going to commit the crime. They have us on audio talking about the details of the crime we're going to commit. And then following the commission of the crime, which we recorded doing our selfies on and uploaded it to Facebook and Instagram, they have a multitude of witnesses that overheard us talking about the crime that we committed, the fact that we wanted to commit it, was glad we did commit it, didn't think we were gonna get caught in committing it, and I can't wait to go and do another crime. At that point, it becomes pretty clear. We are guilty. We have sinned. Paul wrote that all have sinned, Jew, non-Jew. And therefore, we have fallen short of the glory of God. Now, Paul mentions this phrase, the glory of God, twice in the book of Romans, here and in Romans 5. What he's getting at is that we've been disqualified from enjoying God's favor, peace, presence, delight, and the incredible eternity he has prepared for the new heaven and new earth. Again, if we can a little bit liken it to the hu human justice system, which we know is imperfect, but we have to have something. If you committed a grievous crime and you were caught on audio and video and witnesses overheard you bragging about the crime, you will be disqualified from continuing to enjoy your freedom within that society. That just makes sense, amen? Well, it's the same thing. We're disqualified from being before the living God and enjoying his favor. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But then, having found our guilt, having made it clear that we've broken the law and that we ought to be sentenced, this particular courtroom drama, the living God flips the script. You see, here's what's so wonderful about it. And this is why we're about to celebrate communion. We don't get off because of a technicality. We know there are times when people who are straight up guilty 
No doubt about it. As the phrase goes, guilty as? Yeah. And then because of a technicality, they're allowed to go free. In this courtroom, it's as if the judge says to the guilty one, you have committed grievous, horrible crimes. You have caused untold misery and hardship and heartache for many. You have brought chaos and pain and trauma into our society. By rights, we should deprive you of your freedom and even of your life. But we're going to forego the punishment. Not because of a technicality, not because we're not right in enforcing this justice, but we have one who is completely innocent of any and all crimes. We have one who is not only completely innocent of any and all crimes, he has actually kept this society's laws perfectly from the day he was born. He has done everything required to build up this society. He has done everything he needed to do to make this the very, very best society it could be. He is utterly, totally innocent. And he is willing to exchange his innocence for your guilt. If you believe in him now, if you believe, if you count this as true, you will walk out of this courtroom a free man. And he will take your place in judgment. And then the judge says, that person is my one and only son. That is the beauty of the gospel. Is that we must count as true that yes, we have sinned. Yes, we have earned God's judgment. Yes, by rights, we are disqualified from his favor, his presence, his care. But out of love, he sent his one and unique son who did everything his father commanded him to obey his law completely and 100%. And having obeyed that law, and this is what the scripture means. This is what Christ meant when he says, I have fulfilled the law. He says, on the one hand, I have obeyed the law completely. I have obeyed it totally in word, in thought, in deed, in action, and in the intentions of my heart. Christ could say, I've obeyed the word of God completely, totally, without flaw. But the law is also fulfilled when the guilty are punished. And so Christ fulfills the law, not by going straight back to the Father, but by going to the cross. And at the cross, he absorbed the full weight of the Father's fierce, righteous, just anger against sin to pay the cost for those like me who have sinned against him. And so what we must count as true what we must believe is that Christ lived a perfectly sinless life for us. He established a perfect, permanent, right standing for us. And then he went to the cross in order to completely fulfill the Father's righteousness and justice and holiness. Christ died and took our punishment. That is a courtroom twist that we will never see in the movies. Someone might get off because of a technicality, but they don't go free because the judge sends his son in his stead. And that is the promise available to anyone in this room and anyone watching us, whether now on YouTube or Facebook or later. All you must do is admit and recognize and count as true that you have sinned. 
that you have broken God's command. And in so doing, you have earned his just punishment and justice. And that the only way out is to place your faith in Christ and Christ alone. That's the promise we have. That is the very foundation of our walk and our relationship with the living God. That's why we can wake up and think, well, how does God think about me today? I don't know, how well did I do? No, we wake up and think, how does God think about his son, Jesus Christ today? That's how he thinks about me.